It is exciting times for PSE research. It's not all doom and gloom, but I will make some disclaimers about it. Now, I will present some existing and recent research data that may be, slight upset, may be a bit upsetting for some individuals about the, sort of the bad things, but I am going to present the vast majority as good news about the directions of travel that we're heading in with regards to PSE, not just in the UK, but globally. So why is it exciting times? Well, we've started to identify the answers to some of your questions. Who's more likely to need a transplant than others? Some very basic questions that's taken us this long to answer about how PSC affects different age groups and allude to some of the questions about different types of PSC. PSC, well, that's sort of the small duck variety. PSC, that's overlapping with features of autoimmune hepatitis. And somebody talked about Crohn's disease in PSC versus Crohn, uh, ulcerative colitis in PSC. And we're starting to understand those differences in a more clearer way. James has talked about, as well as Gary talked about, transplantation. So I've only got a couple of slides about the recurrent PSC and the timing and type of bowel surgery. And the, uh, there are some more basic sort of basic science developments about why do people with colitis uh, of any sort, it be Crohn's colitis, ulcerative colitis, get PSC. And some, uh, some really exciting work about differentiating cancer in the bile ducts with PSC and bowel cancer without the age of colonoscopy, which will be absolutely fantastic if it comes off. Martin uh, and others have really led the way in, in putting you at the focus of the research that we deliver, and I'm very excited to show some of that early data. And what you're all keen to know is where are we heading in terms of treatments. So, PSE is a rare condition. It affects less than one in 100,000 individuals here in the UK and worldwide. And sadly, without the advent of treatment, medical therapy, more than 50% of people do end up needing a transplant. So a disclaimer here is there will be some graphs. I'll try, I will talk through them. I'm not, I, believe it or not, I'm not actually a fan of, of survival curves and graphs, but there are sometimes the only way to, to explain uh, um, certain <coughs> pieces of data. So if this is 100% and this is 0%, and this is follow-up time since somebody's diagnosed, what you can see is that as time goes on, more than 50% of people will cross the point of needing transplantation. So 50% of people at about 10 to 15 years will end up needing a transplant. And Gary, was it 11 years uh, or something? What was it? Yeah, 11 years. So we'll need. Now, that is, that is associated with a big range. There are some people who have not needed a transplant for, and have been with their PSE for over 25 years. And there are some people who are needing a transplant the year that they're diagnosed. There is a huge range, but that's the average that we see. And it's not just transplants. This is transplant need. So this is transplantation or people who've died without a transplant, but they needed one. Okay? So more than 50% do need one. This graph is the opposite way around because it's time to developing cancer. So again, this is, goes up to 40%. I mean, you can extend it to 100 if you wish. But about 15% of people do end up needing, so, that, uh, so do end up developing cancer. Also, we thought. But actually, cholangiocarcinoma, bile duct cancer, is much rarer than what we see in centres that specialise in cancer. If you take a patient, 1,000 patients and follow them up every year, about seven over 1,000 patients, only seven out of 1,000 patients, after the first year they're diagnosed, will develop it. So it's much rarer than we actually thought. It's not as big of a problem. We, it is a problem because it doesn't have a cure in itself, but it's not as concerning as we originally thought. What we do get concerned about are people who become jaundiced in the first year or two after their PSC first presents, because that comprises about 40 to 50% of all cancer cases. Once you're out of that zone, if you're not, after, after the first few years after PSC has been diagnosed, it's really unlikely that you're going to get uh, bile duct cancer. In fact, I don't think I've ever seen somebody who's developed bile duct cancer sort of after the first two, three years after their diagnosis, which is a really good thing. Okay? The people that we get concerned about with bile duct cancer are those who, yes, have inflammatory bowel disease, because that is a risk factor in itself, but who have jaundice presentations and have just been diagnosed with PSC. We don't know why that relationship exists. It may just be the cancer that's unmasked PSC that's been there for a long time. But if you've had it already for a couple of years, 
it's unlikely you're going to get cancer. Not completely absent, but it's very unlikely. Does that make sense, yeah? Now, this sort of spirograph, spaghetti junction type graph is, is sort of, was drawn to illustrate a point. PSC is related to, some of, uh, to other autoimmune liver conditions. We talked about PBC and autoimmune hepatitis, AIH. There are some commonalities amongst all these things. And I do not like the term overlap. I, I'm not, I, am, I am not ashamed to volunteer my political views in any audience. I'm not a fan of Brexit. Right? I have to admit, it's terrible for research. Right? But to me, the word Brexit and overlap are the same. Sort of, are the, same okay? the term overlap... <laughs> the, term, the term overlap me, implies to a clinician and to a patient that you have more than one disease at the same time. And that means you often get treatment for both things, neither of which may be appropriate. Okay? I've used this particular messy graph uses this term called interface hepatitis. Now, interface hepatitis is what the, uh, the pathologist looks at down the microscope when, he, when they get your liver biopsy. And it's the sort of feature that originally we all thought was restricted to autoimmune hepatitis, a liver condition that sort of is, is, shares some similarity to PSC, in which steroids work, in which azathioprine immunosuppression works. But because there is some commonality between all autoimmune liver diseases, all liver diseases will have some degree of interface hepatitis. All of them will have some autoantibodies um, in, their sort of in their bloodstream. It doesn't mean that both diseases exist. It just means that there are some features of it. So when clinicians talk about that term overlap, it is really important for not just us as fellow colleagues, but also you as a patient who are given that label to say, well, what is the main driver? What do you think is the main disease process? In Gary's case, as he, as he mentioned several times, it was always going to be PSC. It's, uh, and what we see is that in patients who have this overlap feature of autoimmune hepatitis and PSC, so going back to these survival curves, the green line is PSC overlap. The red line is pure, you know, what, what textbook PSC looks like. They generally follow the same course. There is no real difference in their transplant-free survival. The silver lining is, though, that people with small duct PSC do really well. And actually, people who have small duct PSC, that's changes on the biopsy only and, don't ha and have a normal MRI consistently, they actually have a survival exactly the same as somebody without PSC. So that's a good thing. And that's a group of people that I'm really happy to reinsure and make that diagnosis. Because whilst it's important to follow them up, because a tiny proportion may develop proper PSC, a really small proportion, if they have consistently normal MRI scans, then, you know, sort of it's a win. Okay? And I'm, we're really happy to have shown that. The good news about people with PSC, so that, uh, sort of um, AIH overlapping features, is that it's really unlikely for them to get cholangiocarcinoma. So whilst their, their liver disease may need transplantation, they're even, uh, they have an even lower chance of getting bowel duct cancer than people with sort of uh, classical PSC. So that's another group which we can reassure that it's unlikely to be a cancerous diagnosis. Okay? So just to summarize that, there are three types of PSC that we see. There's the classical one where you see beading throughout the bile ducts that James talked about. There's the version where you can only see features on a biopsy, small duct PSC. And there's a version that has a few features that you see with other autoimmune conditions. Yeah, PSC, yeah, yeah. Classical PSC you all know about. Small duct PSC has a survival very similar to that of somebody without the disease. They don't get cancer. It's, you know, it, it's quite a, sort of, it, it, it's quite a, dare I say, benign condition. It doesn't, sort of doesn't really worry me in the clinic, which is good. I'm not saying symptoms aren't important, but the, the outcomes are good. And PSE AAH overlap may still need transplant at the same rate as PSE on its own, but rarely is, do we worry about cancer. Okay. So, last of the, so one of the last few survival curves you'll be glad to know. People often say that, well, if, what, what about the impact of age? On, is it, does it make a difference if I'm diagnosed young or old? <coughs> So when we look at our 7,000 patient experience across the world, surprise, no surprises here, the older somebody is, 
the more likely they are to die. But that's the same in any form of health. I mean, that, that, I'm more likely to die than my, my three-year-old, thankfully. I mean, it's, it's the truth. The older you are, that's not, you know, that's not news, um, to be honest. When we look throughout our UK, so this, so, I looked, so this is looking at everybody who's got PSC and colitis in the UK, diagnosed between 2006 to 6, 2016. And when we split, and this is only adult patients because the way the NHS data regulations are, I can't access data for paediatric age groups yet. Um, people who are diagnosed younger, so 18 to 30, 31 to 40, and you can sort of see the age diagnoses. Liver transplant need and death from liver-related disease is the most. That group of people, so this is the sensitive bit about data I wanted to share. The younger you are, the more likely you are to be in the blue, i.e. need a liver transplant, or if you don't get one, the more likely it is so you are to succumb from it. And it's great that the, I mean, the transplant benefit score that James talked about is changing the death rate because more people are getting a transplant when they need to and less people are dying without it. Just, yeah. Mm-hmm. Perhaps as, as you get older, your immune system is less efficient because you, you're just older and things start to wear out. So, and then when you're younger, when your immune system might be, yeah. you know, working more and yeah. therefore working against itself more. It's, it's possible. We don't know. This is uh, we. It's, it's a it's a it's a great hypothesis. And, but it's something that we do see in, in other autoimmune diseases as well, like PBC we talked about. Mm-hmm. The same thing holds true. So it, 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 maybe that's the case. But certainly the data supports the fact that if when you're diagnosed above the age of 50, 60 years old, mm-hmm. it's unlikely that PSC, it's less likely, not unlikely, sorry, I should say, that PSC is going to cause a problem. There is a silver lining to this, and I'll come to that in a minute for those of you who, 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 who fall in within this age group. But this is why anybody who's diagnosed, particularly at a young age, we want to see in a specialist PSE centre. I'm not taking anything away from your local physicians or your local GPs, but this is the bit that I'm sort of didactic about. Because we will have access to newer therapy earlier because PSE is a rare condition, and the way that the NHS is structured it will allow funding to specialist units first. And that's why the younger patient group, we are keen to see earlier and earlier because that's the group of individuals we are most likely to make a difference in. All right? So, what about inflammatory bowel disease in PSC? Well, again, this is data from our colleagues in Germany. It's about 10 years old now, and this is about cholangiocarcinoma again. We don't see cholangiocarcinoma, or rarely see it in people who, who, who have... PSC without inflammatory bowel disease. It's really rare. So we're now starting to reassure that group of individuals, as small as they may be. The other thing about inflammatory bowel disease is pouches. So does anybody not know what a pouch is? And I'm happy to describe what that is. Yeah? Okay. So when people have bowel surgery, so a colectomy, so removing the large bowel because of active colitis that doesn't get better with medicine or because there is a cancer in the bowel. It's a great intervention to chop it out because you remove the colitis, remove the colon cancer. But some people can be either be left with a stoma, which is a bag, which, uh, where sort of bowel contents from the, what's left behind comes out. And some people down the line choose to get joined up again, so they, they, the, the remaining segments of bowel aren't joined up. What we see in people with colitis alone is that about 20 to 30% of them over the course of 10 to 20 years develop problems. And these are problems holistically de- described as ongoing inflammation in the bowel, problems with sexual dysfunction, problems with fertility, and conception of, sort of, uh, of children. So a whole a global scale of problems. But if you have PSC and you have a pouch, your risks are more than tripled. So there is a real risk that by having a pouch, the risk of pouch problems goes up. I'm not saying you will definitely get it, but it means that the risk is much higher. The saving grace, though, is that people who have an ileostomy and keep that bag, they actually have a much better run. And in fact, we've seen several people whose liver disease is stopped in its tracks when we just when they when we fit them with an ileostomy. But when we connect and when we have people who have a pouch and they decide, actually, can you separate it out again because my quality of life is terrible. Again, their quality of life improves dramatically when that happens. 
So the take-home message is, if you have PSC and you have colitis that needs bowel surgery, have a very good discussion with your surgeon and with your liver and gastroenterology <coughs> consultants about whether the pouch is actually the right thing for you or not. Because certainly in our experience here and that of elsewhere, the outcomes of patients, the quality of life of patients, and certainly the liver disease trajectory is much better if you keep the bag rather than be joined up again. Okay. What about after transplantation? Let's forward on to, we talked about this before. James talked about the, the timing of bowel surgery. So people who have bowel surgery before their transplant are much less likely to develop recurrent disease than those who either keep their, their colon in or have it removed after. Again, it's probability, not an absolute thing. Um, but what we do see is people who have pouches, they lose their grafts much quicker. About 20% of people with pouches will lose their liver transplant. But those who have an ileostomy um, do really well. Um, and, now, and, and those who have got their colon inside and where it's all quiet do really well. But those who have persistent active disease so do badly. 